Welcome, everyone. It's 12.01. It is our Tuesday webinar, and we are uh, launching today's session on managing the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Our speaker today is Kate Campbell, who is the Vice Chair of Strata Societies and Cooperative Associations for the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Um, a note of thanks to um, CuraFlow, who was our sponsor this week, um, and just a little reminder about the question and answer. Um, you're welcome to put any questions into the Q&A and uh, I will um, kind of consolidate all of them as we get towards the end of the session um, and get them up so that Kate can respond to as many as possible that are there. Um, if you have anything specific that didn't get answered today, um, our email addresses are posted and you can always email info at choa.bc.ca for additional information as we go forward. Um, with respect to privacy and confidentiality for your communities, um, please remember, do not identify your name, your strata unit, your strata corporation address or any other information in any of your questions. Um, this is not necessarily secure information and we work very hard to protect everyone's private information. Uh, so Kate, without any further ado, if you wanna share your screen and launch through, that would be just great. great. I will see. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Shouldn't be. Uh, hmm. Let me just. Um, it doesn't say that on my end. Uh, okay. Well, maybe okay. if so you then I'm have to launch. Could, <laughs> could do the uh, do the slides. I will. I yeah. will pay attention to you as close as possible here. Okay, uh, great. Let me, let me just do a little correction here. There we are. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, sure. So if you can go to the first slide that says, what is the CRT? So what I wanna talk about today is just a little bit about our what the Civil Resolution Tribunal is, how people access it, what our goals and mandate are. And then I know people have lots and lots of questions. And I'll just say up front, um, because I'm a decision maker with the CRT, I can't give legal advice. I can't tell you, you know, what evidence you'll need to prove a dispute or something like that. But I can certainly talk about processes, the kinds of things we can order and the things we can't order and uh, sort of a, a slightly more high level approach. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get started. So what is the CRT? Well, the CRT was created uh, by legislation that first came into force in 2016. And it was an attempt to uh, address an issue that had been identified as a crisis in British Columbia around access to justice. That there were many people who couldn't access the court system because of cost and delay and many uh, barriers like geographic location, money being a big one for sure. And so some people in the Ministry of Attorney General and government, also stakeholders outside of gov government came together to create this uh, fairly innovative new system to decide disputes uh, online. So we're the first online tribunal in Canada. Some people say we're the first one in the world that's public as opposed to private. And the goal is to bring the public justice, the justice system to the public. And it is in fact a public system. So it's for the people by the people. So the next slide talks about access to justice. So as I say, that is the overarching goal of the CRT is to improve access to justice. So it doesn't matter where you live, you can live in the far north, you can live on an island. If you have access to a phone or the internet, you can access the civil resolution. Resolution Tribunal. Our goal is to reduce complexity, so remove barriers to parties to file disputes. Uh, our, our, our goal also is efficiency, so to reduce the amount of time it takes uh, to address backlogs that have happened in courts. Uh, as I say, cost, including travel and legal fees and court costs. And then there's proportionality. So uh, basically, you know, small disputes, cause a lot of our disputes are small claims, which would take arguably less time and resources. And, uh, you know, it's not necessary to have a full court trial for, you know, a dispute about a used car worth $5,000. But that doesn't mean it isn't important to the person filing that dispute. So we have a big focus on uh, mediation and facilitation that I'll talk about. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. 
uh, the guiding principles. So these are set out in the legislation. So the CRT is governed under the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act, and it specifically sets out our, our mandate and goals, which are to, it's to resolve disputes in a manner that is timely, flexible, accessible, affordable, and efficient. And there's some details there about what all that means. But basically, it's a dispute process that's supposed to be express, accessible and fair, but it's not exactly like court. Uh, we don't operate on the exact same rules as the court, uh, like all administrative tribunals. So the CRT is part of a system of justice called administrative law. There's other administrative tribunals you may have heard of, like the Labor Relations Board and the Human Rights Tribunal. And in all of those tribunals, the rules of court and the, the formal rules of evidence don't apply in the exact same way, which means we can, for example, take statements that are not uh, notarized by a lawyer or a notary, for example. We don't, it doesn't have to be in the form of a formal affidavit. And the reason for that is primarily around accessibility. Somebody would have to pay usually to get that affidavit drafted and witnessed. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So these are the areas that we currently have jurisdiction over. So jurisdiction meaning authority to decide. So the first area was strata disputes uh, that came into force in July 2016. So we have been deciding uh, strata disputes for almost five years now. And um, the goal with that was to take some disputes that were very, very important to individuals and strata corporations. Um, such as, you know, someone who hasn't paid their bylaw fees or someone who's been, fi bylaw fines, or someone who's been fined and feels that was unfair and unjustified. Uh, things like mm, repairs, um, noise between strata lots, these kinds of things that don't necessarily, previously you primarily had to take those to BC Supreme Court, which was expensive and there was problems with delay. Um, so this was created as a way to deal with those kinds of disputes, which are important, but perhaps don't need full Supreme Court trials. Then in tw June 2017, we've been doing small claims, and then personal injuries starting in 2019, and then societies and co-ops also in 2019. So if you can go to the next slide. I'll talk about how the CRT works. So this is just sort of a broad overview. I'm not going to read all this fairly dense text, but basically we have a process that starts with uh, what we call our solution explorer. And I'm going to talk about that more. It's kind of a self-help legal tool available online. And then that some, for some people that provides the information they need. Then if it doesn't, or if you feel you do need, want to move forward with a dispute, you can apply online. Uh, there's a negotiation phase. Uh, there's uh, often, we have a very high settlement rate. It's around 50% of just all the disputes get filed, actually get settled before a final decision. If they don't, it's adjudicated uh, by a decision maker and you get a written decision. So next slide, and I'll talk about all of this in some more detail. So the Solution is ex Explorer, as I say, it's a self-help legal tool. It's available online. There's been a ton of resources put into it. It's very... Um, oh, we say, I see we have a question. I might not answer all questions that pop up, but uh, I'll answer this one. Is the mediation process without prejudice? Yes, it is. Unless the parties agree that the information about that's talked about in the mediation goes before the decision maker, uh, it doesn't. So effectively it is without prejudice because it's confidential. Our mediators are separate from our decision makers. So, uh, so talking about the solution explorer, um, it's, there's a lot of resources. I actually recommend folks take a look at it online. There's a ton of legal information about the areas of law where we do have jurisdiction. It can tell you uh, what kinds of things the CRT can decide. It gives you some suggestions about steps that have to be taken. For example, there's some areas of the Strata Property Act where you have to send a, a, a request letter for payment and it'll, it'll uh, prompt you to do that before you file your dispute. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, this just talks about a little bit about the Solution Explorer, the, the contents updated quarterly. Uh, as I say, it's it's actually a really powerful resource. Uh, even if you're not planning on filing a dispute, if you just have a legal question about a strata corporation, it's a lot of information in it. And it's all free. And it's all confidential until you apply to uh, pursue a dispute with the CRT. And then it's not. And then you have to give your name. But before that, you can search anonymously. Um, uh, next slide. 
Yeah, it, the first, the, that's fine. It's just, this shows you where you would, uh, the button you would push to look at the Solution Explorer. So all applications, you start with the Solution Explorer and then you, you kind of go through that. So you can just go through the next slide. So basically this, well, it's sort of a decision tree format where you identify some things like what's your dispute sort of broadly about, are you an owner? Are you a strata? Are you a tenant? Um, and then it kind of, it kind of narrows the issues uh, so that either you can help yourself and figure out what you're entitled to and maybe ask for that directly. Or if you're going to file a dispute, you have a clear idea about what the, the real issue in the dispute is. So you can go to the next slide. And then these are some of the pages that will come up with, with legal information. Um, and it's drafted by practicing strata lawyers and uh, government lawyers. It's all, and it's all, um, one of our mandates is plain language. So although all our materials are in English, we aim for a grade six reading level. I don't always quite get that, but we do, it's, you don't have to have a university degree to understand the information, either in the Solution Explorer or in our published decisions. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, similar thing, you can just go to the next one. Yeah, and this is an example. So in some instances, the Solution Explorer will, will take you to a page that gives you a sample letter you could send to either your strata corporation or whoever you think you might have a dispute against asking for what you need before you file the dispute. So for, for, for example, before you file a dispute with the CRT, if you're an owner or a tenant, you have to request a hearing with the strata council and the strata council is required to hold that hearing. The strata property access so. So this is a sample letter that you would send and it actually gives you the information and you would just plug in the name and address and you can print it off and send it or email it. And uh, that way that requirement is met uh, before you get to filing a dispute as opposed to filing your dispute and finding out later, oh, actually there was this other thing you should have done first. So uh, next slide. Yeah, and then it, if, if you go through the Solution Explorer, then you, if you choose to, you can go through the application process, which is online. Now, we do, for people, there are some people in the province who are not online people for whatever reason, sometimes uh, perhaps access to the internet, uh, age, disability, just not going to do that. Uh, so we can't, you can do things either by paper, mostly by paper, mail, and phone, a combination that is available. Uh, I, we've actually been surprised not that many people choose that option, maybe 2%, but it's possible. So you don't absolutely have to do things online, but certainly that's the easiest way. And that's, that's the main way we're set up. Uh, next slide. Um, so applications, once you apply, it's screened for some things like, is this within our jurisdiction, uh, so forth. And then the, the tribunal creates a document, sort of the initiating document called a dispute notice. And then there's some ways in which that's sent to the opposing party. The opposing party has, a, has to file a response. Um, uh, next slide. So one of the main questions we get is, can a lawyer represent me? And the answer is maybe, but probably not. So other than MB, MVI disputes, um, motor vehicle disputes, which are different, and you generally are entitled to a lawyer for some of those. But for strata property disputes, the, the sort of default position set out in the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act is that unless otherwise provided, uh, parties are to represent themselves. Uh, some of the exceptions are for minor children, uh, a few others. But in general, in a strata property dispute with, between adults, uh, parties are to represent themselves. The CRT does have the ability to waive that and allow legal representation when it is in the interests of justice and fairness to do so. We have some cases that talk about when that might be. Uh, I don't, it's sort of outside my scope for today. Um, but that's the general rule is parties represent themselves and uh, you are permitted to use a helper to assist you who could be a lawyer. Um, okay, next slide. So the first stage in the process, after you file your dispute, an applicant and the respondent has responded, uh, is negotiation. And this is purely online. It's a bit like a Facebook chat um, function where the parties can exchange positions. Um, about 20% of disputes actually settle at this stage. Um, it's totally without prejudice. There's actually very little staff involvement. It's just between the parties messaging if they want to um, do that. 
if you settle at the stage, you get your application feedback, which is $125 usually. Um, so that's just the first stage. And it's, it's around a week. Uh, it's, it's lower intervention. It's just, okay, have you considered settling? Um, and uh, if that doesn't happen, if it doesn't settle, then we go to the next slide, which is case management facilitation. So the, the CRT has a number of case managers who are mostly mediators, mostly trained mediators is their role. And they do a couple of things. They sort of help the parties. If the, if the claims set out in the, in the dispute notice are unclear, they work on clarifying what it is the applicant wants and what is it the respondent says their position is. Because uh, sometimes it's a bit unclear. So they work on that. They do um, mediation. I, and they have different processes for how they do that. Sometimes it's, it's all usually on telephone or a video call. Uh, sometimes just by email, depends, depends on what the case manager thinks is appropriate. And um, about by this stage, about 50% of disputes resolve. It is also possible to resolve part of a dispute, but then say, okay, we don't agree about this one thing. We want to go forward with that. So if that's happening and the case is going to go to an adjudicator, the case manager helps with that, gives the parties some neutral information about what kinds of evidence might be relevant, um, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, next slide. So if there's a settlement, you can get an order. It's enforceable as a court order. I'll talk about enforcement of or our orders later. And if not, as I say, if there's no agreement, um, then it goes on to our adjudication stage. Uh, next slide. So adjudication is done. We have a chair, four vice chairs and 15 full-time tribunal members, plus a bunch of part-time tribunal members who are mostly practicing lawyers who work for the CRT on a part-time basis, uh, located throughout the province. Um, they're appointed by the attorney general, well, by cabinet, technically. <clears throat> um, so we're neutral. We don't work for the government. We are, we are appointees um, for a specific term. Most of our adjudication is done online or by written documents, occasionally telephone or video hearings, mostly it's documents. And then the decision will come in writing. Um, and as I say, we aim for plain language. So, um, and they're published on the website, except in certain circumstances, such as where children are involved, which mostly doesn't involve strata, but, or if some, there's a lot of health information, for example, we might, uh, anonymize the decision, but generally they're published. Um, next slide. Okay, so the first stage in the adjudication process, once ev everyone is clear about what the claims are, um, which is not to say they agree about what should happen with those claims. So the first stage is to provide evidence. And the way our system works typically uh, is that both parties are given a chance to upload all of their evidence in, in our online portal. Uh, oh, here's a good question, actually. Am I able to see sample previous cases for my precedent and use them for my case? Yes, they're all published on our website. We have a great website. You can search. Some decisions are marked as noteworthy, which is usually some because there's a good, they're a good example of a common issue or an important issue. So yeah, it's totally searchable. So uh, talking about evidence, uh, both parties are given a chance simultaneously to upload their evidence in our online portal. And they're usually given around a week for this. Um, and then the generally, that's a bit different from court where usually the, uh, the plaintiff or applicant would present their evidence first and then the uh, defendant or respondent would respond. That's, our process is a bit different. It's meant to be a bit more efficient. Uh, we can order it, order it to occur differently if the circumstances justify it. But the general process is both parties upload their evidence at the same time. And then we go through a cycle where the applicant will make a, a written submission about what the claims are about and what the evidence means and what they should get in their, you know, their legal opinion or their lay opinion. And then the respondent would respond and the applicant would have the uh, final say about that. Uh, so next slide. Uh, yeah, we can go through the next slide. Yeah, um, one of the questions that we get a lot around strata disputes, a lot of strata disputes are, do talk about documents a lot, like uh, applicants want certain documents and perhaps the strata either 
doesn't says it doesn't have them or doesn't want to disclose them. Um, so there's two ways that you can get access to documents. One is under the Strata Property Act, under sections 35 and 36, owners and owners primarily, sometimes tenants, are entitled to some documents. They're listed in the act, the kinds of documents, and the Strata proper, Property Regulation says how long the strata is supposed to keep has to keep all those documents. So you're entitled to those as an owner. And the best way to get them is to write, write to the strata, just write them a letter or an email and be as specific as possible about what you want. And generally the strata will provide them. Sometimes they, they're allowed to charge a small fee. Um, if that doesn't, if you're not satisfied with that, you can include that as a claim in your dispute along with other things and we can decide it or it can be worked out in, in the, the facilitation stage often. Um, and we, we, like the court, we do have the authority to do, um, to order disclosure of evidence that's, that's relevant to the proceeding also. So that can be dealt with, uh, after you file your application, but the best place to start is to just write a letter or an email to the strata asking for you what you want. And then you can keep a copy of that and we may look at it later. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so I talked about the CRTs uh, overall is governed by the Civil Resolution Tribunal Act. And of course, all strata corporations are governed by the Strata Property Act. So those are the two acts we look at most in strata property disputes. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what's our jurisdiction? The CRT can't decide every single strata dispute possible. Um, it is because we're set up by legislation. We're not like the courts. We don't have what's called inherent jurisdiction. We have the jurisdiction that's set out in the act, uh, the two acts I've mentioned. So um, to apply to the CRT for a strata property dispute, you have to be a strata corporation or an owner or a tenant. Uh, so for example, disputes with contractors, the CRT can't decide those as strata property disputes. They might be small claims disputes, um, but not, they wouldn't fit with the strata property jurisdiction. Uh, strata sections are treated as strata corporations under the act basically. So they can, they can be applicants or respondents also as a separate party. Um, I said uh, earlier, there has to, you have to have requested a hearing if you're an owner or a tenant, we can waive that requirement um, but generally it's easier to just ask for the hearing and the strata has to hold it. So, you know, maybe it'll resolve things, maybe it won't. Um, next page. Um, so what is our jurisdiction? We can decide claims what in respect of the Strata Property Act. Um, and then the whole list, and I won't read it, but basically it's use of strata lot, uh, interpretation of the Strata Property Act, common property, uh, decisions of the strata, voting, those kinds of things. Uh, it's it's specifically laid out in the strata in the CRTA. Next slide. Uh, so the common issues that we decide. These are the big ones that we see a lot of: water leaks, um, so damage usually, and who has to fix it. Bylaw fines, both collecting and protesting. Repairs and maintenance. Who has to pay for it usually, or must it be done, and when? Financial management, so spending and then doc recording of spending, so financial statements and so forth. Governance, so voting at meetings, how decisions are made, requests for documents, rentals, short-term accommodations like Airbnb, pets, and then nuisance, particularly noise, sometimes smoke. Um, next page. And so what can we do in your dispute? So this, the CRT, like its jurisdiction, its ability to make orders is specified in the legislation. So what can we do in a dispute? Well, we can do a few things. We can order a party to do something like pay an amount of money, fix something, allow access to something. We can order to a party to stop doing something. Um, we can order a party to pay money. And then under uh, section 123 sub two, we can make an order necessary to prevent or remedy in a significantly significantly unfair action decision or exercise of voting rights. So that's generally what's called an oppression remedy. It's pretty broad um, and that comes up quite a bit. So that's what we can, the kinds of orders we can make. Uh, next page. Um, we can't order in what, we can order injunctive relief uh, unlike in our small claims cases, we can't, but we can under 
a strata property dispute. We can't order what's called declaratory relief. So sometimes par parties want basically a statement from the CRT about what the law is or who is right. Sometimes they want a, a statement that a certain bylaw is invalid. We can't really do that, but we can order a party to stop doing something. So in some disputes we've said, well, the bylaw is invalid. We can't order that it's invalid, but we can order the strata to not enforce it until it's changed or uh, we can't make an order requiring the sale or disposition of a strata lot. Uh, the act says that specifically, next page. And then there's a bunch of things we, we can't decide. So defamation, libel and slander, conflict of interest, um, bad faith by council members, unless the applicant is a strata corporation, uh, removal of liens, appointment of administrators, really anything to do with wind up for the most part. And then there's a bunch of other things and they're all listed in uh, CRTA section 122. So one question is, can I go to court instead? I don't want to go to the CRT for whatever reason. Can I go to court? The answer is maybe. Um, so the, the way the legislation is drafted is you, you kind of have to go to the CRT unless either the CRT or the court says you don't. So if, this, if you apply to the CRT and the CRT says, oh, we, we actually don't have jurisdiction over that, then you could go to court. Um, and you could get something in writing from us, or the BC Supreme Court could make an order that uh, you that they'll hear it. So the next page is, uh, yeah. So basically the court would do that if it's not in the interest of justice and fairness for the CRT to adjudicate the claim. And there's some case law about that, and I don't, it's sort of beyond my scope for today. But. Uh, enforcement. So what if the CRT decides your case and orders thing and the other party doesn't do it. Well, under the legislation, all of our orders, oh, we're flipping around here. Uh, yeah, that one. Under the CRTA, all of our orders are enforceable in court. If it's an order for payment of money under 35,000 or a return of personal property, you can go to provincial court. Otherwise, you can go to Supreme Court. And basically what you do is you take our written decision, which you'll get a copy of, You'll get what's called a validated copy, um, and which is just signed off to show it's official. And you can take that to the Supreme Court registry, and they can give you some information, or there's information online about what you can do. Uh, it depends on what it is, if it's payment of money, or if it's you want somebody to do something, it would be a slightly different process. Um, but you would go through the usual court enforcement procedure. Uh, next page. Um, so we have quite a bit of time for questions. So I have a few questions that were sent to me in advance, and then I'll take some of the, I know there's quite a few questions that have come up. Uh, so the first question is, what kind of evidence is necessary if an owner is making, is applying to the CRT to challenge a financial error? So we get those kinds of complaints a lot. Um, audit bank records and transactions. We don't often see audits. I, I don't, Usually that's, there hasn't been an audit yet by the time we're getting it. So that would be unusual. I can't comment on what evidence you would need, obviously, but usually it's, it's bank records and those kinds of things. And they're the kinds of documents that are listed in the Strata Property Act under Section 35 that a strata has to keep and has to give to an owner if they ask for it. So generally that's the kinds of documents that would come up. And then in terms of what we could do about that, I know that's a question. Like, let's say there was a finding that the Strata Corporation had, um, you know, wasn't keeping its financial statements as required in the Strata Property Act and re regulation. Well, we could order it to do so. We could order, um, in some cases, not so much for financial record keeping. It is possible. We, there's a very few cases where we've ordered a strata to pay damages to a particular owner for an unfair action. That would be unusual. And it would have to be something that particularly, particularly affected that owner as opposed to all the owners, most likely. Um, if money's already spent and it's found that, well, it came up, for example, it came out of the operation, operating budget but really it should have come out of the contingency reserve fund. That's a tricky one because the money's gone. You know, if it went to fix the roof or something, can't, you know, undo that. Uh, we can make orders about what the parties can, must do in the future. Um, again, there could be damages potentially if there's a specific owner affected, but generally it's not. Uh, that is a bit of a tricky one. 
Um, but certainly we can make orders about what has to happen in the future. Um, Kate, Kate, Kate yeah. one, of the, one, of the, one of the questions that comes up in connection to this is, can the CRT order an audit? Yes, we have authority to do it. I don't know that we ever have. Uh, I think not. But yeah, technically we could. There would have to be pretty compelling evidence to justify it. But yeah, certainly I would say it's within our jurisdiction to do so. I now uh, okay. I said that unofficially. I, if the right. case were before me, I would have to support that with reasons. But mm hmm. Um, yeah, okay. So the next question was, if a council member has personally benefited from an upgrade or alteration to common property or the strata lot and the strata corporation paid for it, does the CRT have authority to order that amount be repaid to the strata corporation? Probably not. And there, there's two reasons. First of all, the, the person who allegedly benefited would have to be a party because we can't make an order against someone who's not a party. But more importantly, um, we specifically don't have jurisdiction to deal with claims around conflict of interest. Only the Supreme Court can do that. So to the extent that that's a claim about conflict of interest, we couldn't decide it. And sometimes claims about council members are, someone is saying that the council member hasn't met the duty, which is in section 31 of the Strata Property Act to act in good faith and in the best interest of the strata. And what the case law says about that is that um, that's a duty that, that's owed to the strata corporation and not to an individual owner. So we could we could deal with that if the strata corporation was the applicant, but probably not if an individual owner is the only applicant. So uh, next page. Um, okay, if a strata council does not enforce bylaws, like a non-smoking bylaw, and the neighbor continues to do it, um, can one dispute include requests for orders against both the strata council and the offending neighbor? Yes, that happens fairly typically. So you would name, and sometimes our staff, and if you ask them, the staff will help parties identify who should be a party. We can't, or well, I mean, it's ultimately it's usually up to the applicant, but you can ask for some advice about that. We can't give legal advice about what you should argue, but we, we can help talk about, I can't, but the, you know, the mediators and, and uh, intake staff can talk about who, who might be a party. Um, and can I ask the CRT to order the council to enforce the bylaws and the owner to comply? Yeah, we can do that. It's, it's a bit of a hollow, a Supreme Court case that came out two weeks ago just said this. It's a bit of a hollow order because you're required to do it anyway. Like the bylaws are, are mandatory under the Strata Property Act. So having the CRT order you to follow the bylaws doesn't really order you to do anything you weren't already required to do but we can do it sometimes we do sometimes i think it's it clarifies things um, nice nice to have somebody else as a third party tell you what you're supposed to do sometimes yeah and then technically then you if the person doesn't do it you could go to supreme court and ask for enforcement without having to prove on the face of it about the violation i suppose so, right, right. Okay, uh, so we should we can take some more questions. How do you want to do this, Tony? I'm, to... I'm managing them, so I'll okay. um, I'll just kind of filter them through. I'm kind of putting them together sure. into kind of topics sure. to make it easier sure. for you. So, um, is the CRT capable of managing issues that may also be human rights issues at the same time? Yes, there's a bit of an overlapping jurisdiction there. So, strata corporations obviously are required to follow the human rights code, and if you have a dispute that is essentially saying the strata hasn't followed the human rights code, for example, by not accommodating a disability would be a typical one. Technically, you could take that dispute to either the human rights tribunal or the CRT, um, either one. Now, you can't do both at the same time. Um, one would have to be sort of put in abeyance. But yeah, th there is an overlapping jurisdiction there. And so, but certainly the CRT can make orders about the human rights code, about the, about the applicability. Um, generally, if it's a dispute about the meaning of the human rights code, that would go to the human rights tribunal. We would generally defer and uh, suggest that you take that claim directly to the human rights code uh, tribunal. So the most common 
requests that we ever see with respect to HRT has to deal with access to buildings. Yeah. Um, and, and that is and that is well within the jurisdiction of the CRT to respond yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. Typically. Um, an, another area that we see um, and a lot of questions around this again um, in advance as well as on the screen is around unauthorized alterations. Mm -hmm. uh, and this comes up frequently, especially with um, uh, investors who buy units to try and do massive alterations, flip them, um, and then get out as quick as they can for profit. Um, mm -hmm. It leaves both the new buyers and the corporations in, in a, quite a mess quite often. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, um, I guess the, the question really is, who is the best applicant in those circumstances? And is it, is it more of a is it more of a strata corporation enforcement issue at the time and 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 more complicated this becomes is what happens when the person who did the alterations is left and now you're left with a a new owner stuck with unauthorized alterations mm -hmm. it, it, it really creates a, a complicated dispute process it does for sure and I, I think the answer you know who who should be the applicant it kind of depends on the circumstances and what the what is wanted the crt wouldn't have jurisdiction to make an order against likely wouldn't have jurisdiction to make an order against the former owner if they're sold and are long gone uh unless it was pretty recent but in in general hmm, i'd have to think about that it'd be tricky I, I would flag that as a potential jurisdiction problem around the former owner um and often we see these, it's the, the strata corporation and whoever bought the strata lot might be co-applicants because they have kind of a similar interest. Uh, sometimes though, it's the, 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 the new owner of the strata lot is claiming against the strata saying the strata should have intervened and not permitted the alterations because they alleged the strata knew about it or ought to know about it. So it kind of depends. Um, I'm just seeing a comment from Alex Wait. Chang. The Downing decision says that claims can be with for the former owner. Yes, and depending though on when the claim arose, like if the claim arose while this, the owner was, um, the former owner was involved. Uh, and if, you're, if what you're looking for is damages, which often is what people want, uh, that arguably wouldn't be a claim arising under the Strata Property Act. It would be a tort claim. So there could be a jurisdictional problem there. Um, but I'd have to decide it if it ever came before me. But yeah, but yeah, we see lots of cases about unauthorized alterations. Also, you know, for example, an owner puts up an unauthorized fence on, you know, on common property, let's say, and they didn't get permission. And now the fence is, falling apart and unsightly and a neighboring owner wants the strata to fix it. Well, who's responsible for the fence? Uh, because it was unauthorized in the first place. This is a common dispute we see. So, yeah. Uh, similar to that in townhouses, we see common disputes um, with respects to um, townhouses and decks and patios where, where owners will install decks or expand patios or take over common area, yeah. which, seems fine until somebody complains about it or or they're doing it based upon what the other owners appear to have which may or not may not have been within the bylaws and so yeah. you know that ends up generating into a dispute as well so yeah so, so the, but but it comes to the nature of the question that i was looking at um mm -hmm. and, the, and the question is um does the past practice of the strata corporation or what was permitted in the past does that come into part of the evidence um, when considering the resolution of a dispute? Often, yes. People certainly will provide evidence about that. Sometimes it's persuasive. Like, it, it's not always determinative. I mean, it depends on what the bylaws say. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, and under, there's a decision called Foley from the BC Supreme Court. It, it's a case about um, what, what is a significant change to use or appearance requiring a three-quarter vote. But it's a case that's cited for lots of reasons, and it talks about that. The past practice is a relevant factor. It's not the only factor, and it's not sometimes, you know, in the face of a bylaw that says something different, it's not that persuasive, but it's certainly relevant. Um, well, and strata corporations are notorious for ignoring their bylaws anyhow, so. Yeah, 
because that's the other yeah. challenge. <laughs> yeah. And that might go to a significant unfairness argument. You know, if the if the Strata Corporation has allowed uh, one we see is installation of air conditioners and they, you know, people drilling holes in the wall to put in an air conditioner. Um, usually the bylaws don't allow that. Right. Uh, certainly not without written permission. But if people have been doing it and the strata can obviously, you know, you can see them from the outside of the building. And then they say, no, you owner 12 can't do that. You can maybe make an argument that that's significantly unfair to you. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. So changing streams a little bit. Um, this is a, um, a bit confusing, I think, for um, the management industry as well as for um, uh, strata corporations. But what role can the property manager play in CRT disputes and applications? Because they're, you know, the mixed message from um, from industry, um, but also with practices, some property managers feel they can act as if they are the strata corporation as the agent. Others mm-hmm. do not at all. So, yeah. yeah. So technically, under our rules. Um, which, which are binding on parties. The strata corporation has to be represented in a CRT dispute by a strata council member. And, and generally the strata council would have to have a vote to pick someone, although, yeah, that's, that's the official procedure. In order, you can ask to be represented by someone else. The tribunal has to give permission. Sometimes that would be a lawyer, sometimes it might be a property manager, but you'd, you'd kind of have to have a reason uh, why a strata council member can't do it. Now, having said that, usually the strata council member would work in conjunction with either a lawyer or a property manager or someone else. Like, there's not a requirement that you totally go off on your own. But for example, in mediation calls, it would be the strata council member who would who would speak. Um, and you know, you can basically get whoever you want to help you write with your write your submissions. Um, our rules permit that and. Yeah, but officially it's a strata council member has to be the representative of record. Yeah. Uh, Often the property manager is an important witness, depending on what has happened, if it's something they would know about. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, um, if there, um, so here's another question, um, but this would, and there, there are loads of questions in relationships and meetings, but here's another mm-hmm. question. The Um, Strata Corporation issued incorrect notice for the general meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, The outcome of the meeting was still held and all the resolutions were passed, but but the question around incorrect notice has affected several owners who don't live on site. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, so so what is the authority of the tribunal with respects to the outcome of that meeting? Well, there's some provisions in the Strata Property Act around notice and whether or not it invalidates certain certain things. So that would be relevant. But let's say we found that the, you know, whatever vote wasn't valid because of, you know, like a resolution requiring a three-quarter vote was voted on and the text of the resolution wasn't included in the notice package. Generally, there's a whole bunch of cases that say that stratas are democratic. So the strata council is elected from the ownership. There's rules in the Strata Property Act and standard bylaws about democratic process, there's to be minutes and decision making and certain types of voting. So generally, if if the CRT makes a finding, and this comes from the BC Supreme Court, so if the court or the CRT makes a finding that that democratic process, including things like no, meeting notice, hasn't been met, the first proper remedy is to rehold the vote. And that comes from this case called Foley that I mentioned and some other cases. So, and that's not necessarily a remedy that everyone is completely happy with, um, but that is the sort of first point of remedying it. So it, it's not necessarily for the CRT to step in and say, no, you should have, the, the vote should have gone this other way. We say, no, you have to correct the vote itself by holding an SGM or sometimes it's time for the next AGM um, by then anyway. But um, that's the starting point, is to rehold the vote. And so if a strata corporation wanted to be proactive and, and actually kind of is aware that maybe there was a flaw in the notice, you could hold an SGM and fix it, arguably. But. Okay. 
Um, so now this is the other side of tribunal, and, and there are lots of questions around this. Um, mm -hmm. but, what, but what authority does the tribunal have um, to dismiss claims that become a chronic nuisance from individuals? Um, if you have, been, you, so you have someone who essentially is just looking to use the tribunal as a weapon, essentially against their strata corporation. Um, yeah. At what point can the tribunal step back and say, you know what, this is not um, going to continue? So under Section 11 of the CRTA, the CRT has the authority to refuse to resolve a claim that is an abusive process or where the dispute application doesn't set out a sort of a legitimate claim. Like there's no, it's kind of no possible claim. That's a very, and there's a lot of case law about abusive process and what that means. So it's a fairly high threshold. So the fact that a claim is annoying or maybe the, the individual or party has filed lots of dis disputes in the past, it's not gonna be enough, but where, where it's found that a claim is, a, is an abusive process, we can refuse to resolve it. So that's the main, um, aspect of that. And th there's also some, some law that talks about what's called res judicata, which means already decided. And this is common law. It's true in the courts. It's true in administrative tribunals. So if, if basically the same issue between the same parties has already been decided, you can't decide it again. And this comes up quite a bit. So, and it, it's, re it's related to abusive process again. So you can't, just keep litigating the same thing over and over if you don't like the outcome. So those are the two main things, the two main tools we have on that. And then, you know, at some point, um, like it, it's at the discretion of the tribunal, for example, if your claim is found to be an abusive process, whether or not we would refund the application fee. Um, you know, if it was a mistake, maybe, but maybe it would depend. But technically speaking, there's no limit to the number of legitimate claims that may arise from part, from a party. No. And we have a process of joining claims. So if there's, if there's a party who has multiple claims against the same opposing party, we would try and stream that a bit and not have each one go through separately all, you know, in succession necessarily. So there's some sort of case management that would go on with that. Mm -hmm. So there are some parts of the Strata Property Act that are um, vague or, uh, or general in nature. And one of them is um, depreciation reports. So mm -hmm. depreciation reports are estimates. Um, they are not um, uh, cast documents that compel parties to any type of action. Um, mm -hmm. but, but there are a number of questions and it is a frequent question is, um, could a, an applicant um, uh, make an application to the CRT um, to uh, force some adherence to a depreciation report um, if the report's being followed. Complication is, of course, the reports themselves are just purely estimates and they are not compelling to be followed. That's one of the challenges, right? Yeah, so generally on the face of it, I mean, I can't really give a legal opinion, but on the face of it, no, unless you can argue maybe that there's some kind of significant unfairness or we, we, we decide lots of claims, though, about whether specific maintenance and repairs have to occur. So, you know, the roof is leaking. No one will fix the roof. Uh, the owners, you know, voted against a, a special levy or a strata fee increase to pay to fix the roof. We decide those kinds of claims. Um, right. but, that's a, but that's an order to maintain and repair common property. Yeah. 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 But to, uh, in order to follow a depreciation report, not an I mean, I suppose there could be a bylaw that says it's binding in some way, but I have never seen that. Yeah, no, but exactly. The strata, the strata Property Act doesn't say you have to follow it. It says you have to either get it or waive it, but yeah. Exactly, and then the language throughout is estimated language anyhow. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think the, the, you touched on this, but maybe if you could just expand on it a bit about what happens when um, a responding party does not respond or engage? Yeah, so I, I, that's a good question. Um, so I noticed a question pop up too about how do you serve a respondent? So basically once you apply to the CRT, uh, generally the CRT will take care of sending the dispute documents to the respondent and a, they'll be given a deadline to respond. You can also do it yourself if you want and there's some rules about how you do that. 
Uh, but generally the C CRT will take care of it because um, it was found to be a bit of a barrier in terms of access to justice to make people, you know, hire a process server or something like that. So generally, and especially with strata corporations, as uh, if the strata corporation is the respondent, you know, they're not hard to find, <laughs> particularly, unlike, you know, in, right. in some civil proceedings. Um, so the CRT will send off the documents and the respondent is given a certain amount of time to reply. They can ask for an extension and it's often given if there's, you know, as long as it's not excessive. Um, and if the respondent doesn't meet that deadline by and file a dispute response, and there's a form for that, um, there's are the act and rules basically say that they're what's in default, which means that there's an assumption that the applicant is right and the respondent is wrong, and you can get an order against the respondent without their participation. We don't see this a lot in strata, a little. We see it a lot in small claims where the respondent often say a debt, you know, because um, they don't have the money. So they just don't respond. That's less true in strata, but we do make default orders. So basically what happens is um, the applicant can pay, I think it's $50 and um, fill out a form asking for a default order. And then uh, a tribunal member will look at that and make the order, unless it's something the only time we wouldn't make the order is if it's something that's unenforceable or something that's just not within our authority to give. Um, but so, um, so a common a common repeat of this we see um, is in smaller strata corporations under mm -hmm. under fifteen under ten units where mm -hmm. one person has been in control of all the documents in the bank accounts for years mm -hmm. and and owners are trying to get access to documents records um, mm -hmm. and so they don't respond. Um, they won't respond to requests under Section 35 mm -hmm. for documents. Mm -hmm. So they make an application um, to the CRT, but even then um, the individual is not responding. Um, you know, it's a, um, it, in, especially in smaller strata corporations, this is where the, the source of the conflict becomes really that much more complicated. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in that case, I mean, the proper respondent is the strata corporation. So technically it's not just one person, but it, as you say, in a lot of smaller strata corporations, kind of really is one person who has, doesn't have the documents that certainly that becomes difficult. And it's a, it's a difficulty with smaller strata corporations. Generally, I, like one of the things we often see with duplexes is the parties will say, well, we're non-conforming strata. We don't follow the strata property act. We've never had a budget. We've never, you know, what there's, well, but technically there's no such thing. The strata property act exactly. doesn't have different rules depending on the size of your strata. If it's 3000 units, if it's three units, it's all the same. So we can't make an order based on the idea that you're this somehow this more flexible strata corporation. Maybe, <laughs> The legislation should be different, but that's not something we can change. It, we have to follow the legislation that is. So, um, yeah, I mean, in that case, the case you're mentioning where, you know, one person in a small strata has really controlled things, really the remedy, the overarching remedy may be to, to change how the strata is governed in practice. And, you know, whether or not the CR can, CRT can make orders about that, I won't weigh in on possibly for sure but um and but characteristically that behavior tends to follow things like lack of having an annual general meeting mm -hmm. um, lack of bylaw enforcement yeah. you know you have one individual who's held mm -hmm. control over their small corporation for a long time and yeah. so so it really yeah. needs so it could potentially be an order for a general meeting Mm -hmm. could, yep. you know, could be a potentially yep. order to comply with bylaws and order to disclose yeah. documents. Yeah, we could uh, order the product, like order a strata to create financial statements by a certain date um, if they haven't, you know, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's where it gets complicated, though, because you're ordering the corporation to do these things. Yeah. Whereas the individual who really has, mm -hmm. a, you know, who is really obstructing the process. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's challenging, certainly. And we can't tell, I mean, you know, if there's a smaller number of units generally sort of by default under the Strata Property Act, everyone's on the Strata Council. So to some extent, the other owners might just have to get together and say, this is how the Strata Council is going to run. But uh, is that a CRT order? Maybe not. <laughs>
Maybe not, um, but but you know it's you know pretty much every strata under twenty five units that self managed mm -hmm. is vulnerable to this. Mm -hmm. So which which yeah. was very much you know in the days of creation of CRT, which was very much the intent of making the CRT available yeah. um, as a very strong support mechanism. So yeah, and I do know that this is one of the areas where our mediation process is perhaps more useful than our adjudication process because in mediation, you know the parties are required to participate and we have various things we can do if they don't and you know there can be a discussion about you know do these documents even exist it, you know if not why not those kinds of more informal discussions um, are really well suited to mediation I would suggest and the fact that we offer free mediation is well once someone's applied which is only usually $125 it's actually a, a great resource I would suggest uh, yeah, no, no, we, it, it's certainly a, a resource that we um, recommend for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's kind of the bulk of the nature of, of the, of the questions with respect mm -hmm. to most of the practices that come through here. Um, mm -hmm. I was just looking to see if there was anything else that was unusual, but it pretty much covers the topic of most of them. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. There's a lot of material yeah. to cover. I, I appreciate the chance to talk about the CRT. That's great. Well, right. thanks, every, thanks everyone yeah. for joining us today. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Kate, um, again, for mm -hmm. joining us. Um, next week's webinar, if you're interested, is insurance for complicated strata corporations. And so it's strata corporations with commercial and residential um, mixed sessions that have airspace parcels or strata corporations that run commercial enterprises as part of their entity. And <clears throat> that will include golf courses and resorts and any other type of function for strata corporations that have commercial entities. So um, uh, thanks very much everyone for joining us today. And um, uh, this session again will be saved and it'll be loaded up on our website for future access. And uh, Kate, again, one more time, thanks very much and everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks.